The ministry of apologetics is often referred to as a discernment ministry. But that's something I think everybody in the church needs today. A little bit of apologetics, a little bit of discernment in their thinking. In fact, maybe more than just a little bit. How about a lot for the world that we live in today? It is also a, a misunderstood and often misconceived work to talk about apologetics and discernment because oftentimes you're dealing with the work of other people or the thoughts of other people and a lot of people are just uncomfortable with it. And they say that people like me, people who are in the ministry of apologetics are just against everything and that's not true. I'm for a lot of stuff. I'm for the Bible. I'm for Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, I'm for salvation by grace. I'm for the doctrines the church has stood on, and I hope you are too. But uh, a lot of people misconstrue the idea of apologetics just thinking that we're a bunch of guys who are against everything. And I've often said that I'm a real positive guy that God has talked to, uh, called to talk about some pretty negative stuff, but hopefully I can do it in such a way that it's just not... That you don't think that I just, I'm against everything that comes along. The topic we're going to talk about here that we're going to spin off from uh, in this message uh, is one that I tried to get away from. I really didn't want to talk about it. I've been really busy this year. I didn't feel like that I wanted to spend the time to research another book that was out there, but this is just something I felt like I couldn't get away from. So misunderstood or not, apologetics is a needed ministry in the church. And as my friend and my colleague Jim Spencer, who's another apologist and writer and author and speaker, he commented to me one time not long ago that he thought discernment in the church was at an all-time low. And, and I believe he's right about that. Now, Jim was not referring to those who were on the theological fringe or who were somehow considered to be liberals. But the lack of biblical thinking in evangelical and even in fundamentalist circles, people who would say they believe in the inerrancy of the scripture and the Bible, is a little more than breathtaking in the day that we live in. Complacency and apathy, I believe, uh, have a part to play in this. It seems to rule today. And though it's not necessarily overt rebellion causing what we see, the result is certainly the same. The church is full of people who do not know their Bibles. Now, I know that sounds presumptuous to say, but it's obvious from the fruit that we see coming forward. I'll say it again. The church is obviously full of a lot of people who want the benefits of Christianity, who would, have, who would say that they're born again, who would say they believe the scriptures, but they don't know what the scripture says. And for various reasons, they have decided not to study to show themselves approved. Maybe they don't care to, maybe they don't have the time to, maybe their priorities are wrong, but for whatever reason, so many people feel like that uh, uh, it's really not that big a deal that they don't understand all these scriptures. Maybe they've never been challenged by it. And I hope that in the making of this DVD and the people who are watching right now by DVD uh, will, will be challenged about what they believe and why they believe it. That's really what apologetics is all about, that Bible school term for the defense of the faith. These folks would claim to be saved, yet they've fallen into what I believe is a demonic trap that has been set in this end times that's been aimed right at the church. Now, in the message, The Most Dangerous Cult, I've explored the following passages, but they equally speak to this topic as well. And for our outline in the very day that we live in, I think that we need to understand that, that Paul is speaking through Timothy, or to Timothy, to us for this day that we're in. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 reads as follows. This know also, that in the last days, that's where I believe we are today, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And here it speaks directly to where we are as the church because this isn't talking about the world, folks. This is talking, this passage is speaking directly about the church. Verse 5 says, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And Paul says, from such turn away. When we see people teaching things that are not in in, uh, in harmony with the gospel, not in harmony with the teaching that Jesus and the apostles left us. We're not to sit around and dialogue with them. We're not to, we're not to try to, to somehow uh, sit there hoping we can change their, their minds about it. 
Paul says, for your own good and your family's good, he says, from such turn away. If they will not follow the truth, don't follow what they say. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captives, silly women, laden with sin, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Many of these people be highly educated, but they won't rely on the truth. Now Paul goes on in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, Timothy, and to you and me in the church today, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, and then do things that the church doesn't do a lot of today. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and with doctrine. Now, when I mentioned a minute ago that we're not to dialogue with these people, I mean that we're not to sit into their teaching, trying to hopefully persuade them to change. I want a dialogue, if you will, with, with people who are in error, but I'm not going to receive what they have to say if they're not following the Scripture. Paul goes on in verse 3 here in 2 Timothy 4 and says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. That means they'd rather believe a myth than the truth. But Paul says to Timothy, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, and he says, For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now the topic mentioned in the subtitle of the message is just the kind of deception that we can expect to infiltrate evangelical and Christian circles in the day that we live in. And as we examine William P. Young's book, The Shack, we're going to see how discernment is taking a back seat to truth in many of our churches and many lives today. And so here's our premise of the message. First, I want to say, I don't hate anybody. I'm not, this is not a hate campaign about Paul Young. I'm not saying Paul Young is demonized. That is not what we're telling you. That's not what we're trying to say. I have met with him personally, and so I'm not trying to say those things about him. But uh, a lot of people, they just don't want to hear about this stuff because they've already made an opinion based on the popularity of a book like The Shack. Now, I prefer not to be bound by my notes uh, as much as I'm going to need to be in this presentation. However, for the sake of accuracy, I'm going to be reading from my notes quite a bit. I've been compiling the material that's in this presentation for over six weeks now. And I've done little except uh, read and research and refine and pray about what needs to be said for over three weeks straight in a row. That's all I've done is deal with this. There are over 235 slides in the file that I've got before me. And that's not meant to, to give my video producer Jeremy a heart attack, but that's how many slides I've got before me here. And I'm just going to trust the Lord as to which ones I'm refer to refer to and which ones I'm to skip. And uh, you'll have to trust that, that some of the things here are just too weighty, too much, and we're not going to try to make a three-hour presentation out of this. This blockbuster book, The Shack, however, was written by a man who claims to be a Christian. Does that in itself make it biblically sound? Well, of course not. The shack speaks to God, speaks to a trinity, and speaks about a Jesus. But does this in itself make it biblically sound? The shack has apparently touched many, many lives in an emotional way. But does this in and of itself make the book biblically sound? The shack has been accepted and endorsed and defended by many people who I thought and would have to still think somehow we're mature Christians. But does that in itself make it biblically sound? Instead, could it be, as I've already stated, that is the shack just the kind of deception we could expect in these end days? In the last days, we need to carefully examine everything that comes along, in particular those things who claim to be, or that claim to be, a message from God. When the church fails to test everything through the holy filter of the Bible, then deception comes in, and with it comes division. When deception is there, you can guess. You can, you can, you can guess ahead if deception is, is present that discernment is not. 
Now, a pastor friend that I've known for many years made this statement to me on the telephone just last week. He said, unity is to the kingdom of God what this unity is to the kingdom of darkness. I'll say it again because it's an important statement. Unity is to the kingdom of God what disunity is to the kingdom of darkness. Now, it's a simple statement, but it is so accurate and so true. God wants us to be unified, but our unity is not around our feelings. Our unity must be around his inspired and infallible word. The devil wants to bring disunity. And there'll be people would say that I'm causing disunity, that it is my fault for talking, as I will be in this presentation, uh, about the book, The Shack, and uh, about these issues. But the truth is, any time we decide to go our own path and not follow what the Word of God says, then we're going to be walking in disunity because we're going to be outside the bounds of what His Word has instructed us. Our unity must be solely based on the truth of the Bible, Otherwise, it is lost and unity is destroyed. The popularity of the book, The Shack, by William Paul Young, he likes to be called Paul, and the controversy concerning the doctrines it teaches speaks loudly to the need that we need to discuss discernment and the level of our reliance on the scripture in the church today. Now, back in 1999, when uh, Dave Benoit, my co-author of Entertaining Spirits Unaware, when we decided to, to write that book and we embarked upon the co-writing of that project, I remember Dave sent me an outline of the chapter titles he thought should be in the book. And uh, one of the chapter titles was about the Harry Potter book series. And I remember calling Dave on the phone. Now Dave live, lives in Virginia now. And I remember talking to him on the telephone and, and saying, Dave, uh, Harry Potter is a no-brainer for Christians who read the Bible. And in that one minute, it was like instantaneously it struck me. Oh, yeah, it'll be a no-brainer for Christians who read the Bible. But there'll be a lot of Christians who are not reading the Bible, going on their feelings and going what is on uh, the popularity charts, if you will, around us, and what the world calls good and what other Christians around them in church may be calling good. You see, and, and when the book was released, then came the endless string of emails to us. And so many of them started out with this one statement. I finally did a, a, a big newsletter about it. We got all these emails that said, I'm a Christian, but... And then they began to tell me why we were so totally wrong about Harry Potter and there was nothing wrong with the Harry Potter series and that we were crazy. Well, we took a lot of heat on our positions back in those days and we continue to do so today, even to this day, nine years later. But it's just because Christians are illiterate about what the scripture says that people would write to us and argue about even the morality of the characters in the Harry Potter series, let alone the witchcraft that is presented in the storyline. Regardless of how unpopular or how rejected the ministry of discernment is today, the scripture instructs us to carry on. And in much the same manner, the Apostle Paul instructs Timothy and, and he tells Titus these same things. He makes the point in Titus chapter 2 verse 1 and Titus 2.15. He says, speak thou things which become sound doctrine. And he says, speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. And that's what we need to do. The same kind of things that he said to Timothy, he says to Titus. And those are two important uh, books for the church today because they're books that we, we can look and base what we believe as a church body around those things. Now I realize the shack contains so many ideas that sounds so very good and sound almost biblically correct. But the key word there is almost correct. And you know, you can be uh, just a little bit off if you're taking off from earth and you're heading toward the moon. You've heard this analogy before. And you're, you're just a little bit off, just maybe a half a degree off. By the time you get out there, you'll be so far off, you cannot course correct back to make it to your destination. You're lost, in other words. So I also want to acknowledge that my words may be distressing to some and they may, be, they may anger other people, especially those who are unwilling to change their positions concerning something like the shack, regardless of the facts and how they may be presented to them. However, my responsibility, in fact, our responsibility as a church is not to tell men what they want to hear. Instead, we must faithfully express what God has commanded us to say, telling people what they need to hear and not, as, not what just is popular to them. So it is with sadness in my heart that we need to once again discuss another book that has overtaken the Christian world. 
The fact that this book has risen to such prominence displays just how low the Bible and its doctrines and the study of them have really become in our priorities. And now I fully understand that the shack is a novel. Please understand that I'm not, uh, I haven't missed that somehow. The shack is a novel. It was never originally intended for public consumption, but make no mistake, it is unquestionably teaching doctrine. Now I want to read to you from Amazon.com, from the description given about the book The Shack on Amazon.com. It is one that was obviously written by those who have who've, uh, uh, published the book. And it talks about what it's about. So here it is. Mackenzie Allen Phillips, youngest daughter Missy, has been abducted during a family vacation. And evidence that she may, be a, may have been brutally murdered is found in an abandoned shack deep in the Oregon wilderness. Four years later, in the midst of what he refers to as the great sadness, Mac, that's her father, receives a suspicious note apparently from God inviting him back to the shack for a weekend. Against his better judgment, he arrives at the shack on a wintry afternoon and walks back into his darkest nightmare. When he finds, what he finds there will change Mac's world forever. In a world where religion seems to grow increasingly irrelevant, the shack wrestles with the timeless question, where is God in a world so filled with unspeakable pain? Once again, that is from Amazon.com. Now, this book has gotten some high accolades. Author Eugene Peterson, who put together the paraphrase, The Message, called this book Pilgrim's Progress for Our Generation. I certainly can't hold that statement, but that's what he said. Michael W. Smith and his wife loved the book, evidently. They're on the back cover of the book. Winona Judd, the country singer, says it changed her life. People are talking about how their lives have been revolutionized by this book. One reviewer, Emily Harris from uh, uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting, she said... The book has found passionate embrace among people who shun institutional religion and seek a close personal relationship with God. Now folks, if you, uh, if you, if you don't know already, if you somehow have been out in a cave someplace, this book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. As of the making of this DVD today, it has been at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for 20 years. One weeks. It is number one on Amazon.com as of October 18th of 2008. It is number two in the top 150 50 bestsellers on USA Today. It is vacillating back and forth in the top 10 at BarnesandNoble.com. And it is number one at ChristianBook.com, the number one best selling book for all of 2008. Now, The Shack is the is written by the first-time author William P. Young. It is a religious theological fiction. It has sold over 3.8 million copies, according to Newsweek magazine, September 8, 2008. I know for a fact it's now well over 4 million copies in 20 different languages. And Oprah Winfrey is reportedly reading the book. I mean, doesn't that settle it? That all Christians had better read the book because Oprah, the great theologian Oprah Winfrey, I'm joking, of course, is now reading the book and considering the book for her book club. Multiple motion picture production companies are attempting to secure the rights for this book. There is one offer of over $100 million to, pre to present and to, to produce the motion picture, The Shack. It's just not a book, folks. It's going to be a movie, and that's big in the culture that we live in. However, there's a reason why dozens of publishers turned The Shack down. Dozens of them did so, according to the author himself. And this caused he and two of his friends to start a publishing company to publish the book. Though I had heard of the book before, several months uh, before we make this presentation or this DVD, I was first alerted to the controversy surrounding the shack when a senior couple in our church asked me about it. My pastor and I were standing together in the foyer of our church. And uh, we both became aware of what this book was about and the fact that many seniors in our own church were reading this book. And I guarantee they did not get the recommendation from my pastor from the pulpit. And they didn't get these ideas that are presented in the book as being biblical from my pastor from his pulpit either. Preachers are preaching from this book, however. Sunday school and small groups are being taught from it. Many Christians are buying it by the case and giving it away as gifts. 
And we know that some Christian schools are also sanctioning and encouraging the reading of the book by both their staff and faculty and by their students. After going through this book, Melanie and I agreed that this was an issue that we had to address, even though it was one I didn't want to get into. This is why I recently took time and I traveled to Portland, Oregon to meet and speak to the author of The Shack personally. Paul Young is a nice fellow. He was raised in New Guinea by strict Protestant missionary parents in a region called Cannibal Valley. During his time overseas, he was sexually abused by local natives starting at age four and later by older students in a missionary boarding school. Young was taught to fear God, who he was told was punishing and perfect. He told Newsweek magazine writer Lisa Miller, for those of us who are damaged, there is no hope in that at all. Young was interviewed on, radio program, on the radio program Think Out Loud on Oregon Public Broadcasting June 30, 2008. And he said, my wife, and his wife's name's Kim, my wife wanted me to put in one place sort of how I felt about God, about life, process, and pain. He stated that he wrote the book after 38 years trapped in his own shack of shame, which was brought on by childhood sexual abuse, being sent to Christian boarding school, and the perceived abandonment of his parents. He indicated that his parents were, quote, sold out to the work of God. But the interview reveals very clearly how bitter Young is about his upbringing. He says he became lost and disassociated from his parents. And decades later, it all culminated in a three-month affair with his wife's best friend. Young made a very telling statement during the June 30th interview in Oregon. He said, but you know, all the religious stuff in my history, as much as I pursued God through looking for a way to please him and get the affection of the Father, as it were, and my own issues with my own dad, all wrapped up in that, none of it healed the stuff. It didn't change me on the inside. And then he says, it wasn't until bad theology fell away and a relationship opened up, and then I began to find out that when I reached the door of the shack, God had been there the whole time and waiting for me to deal with it. What Young is saying here is that Orthodox Christianity, its theology and its doctrines, or at least his perception of them, was the problem, and he never found any answers there. Now, people are going to say, and it's been said so many times, but, but he got helped from, from this idea. He got his own help, and so many others have been helped by reading what his perception of God is. But the truth is that God has healing for all who will follow him through his word. And at the same time, there is satanic counterfeits all around us. And the devil's more than willing, more than happy to accommodate. If people don't want to follow God's word, the devil will give them a perception because he comes as an angel of light. He wants to give a perception that God is touching your life or that God can heal you through uh, other ideas. Remember, this is a season when the devil is going to be doing a lot of that kind of work inside the church, the end of the end days. And if we allow him access, those counterfeits will become a part of our life. This is a deadly place to be, and it led William Paul Young to begin to fashion his own religion, complete with his own version of God and his own cultic doctrine. And as much as the story might connect with the heartstrings of individuals who have been broken, we must caution about this. Seeking after healing and acceptance from a version of God who is clearly not the biblical one is an eternally deadly mistake. And knowing God is not an unsure science as, as William Young seems to think it is. Unless, that is, you want to reject God's word as final authority and then it's all up for grabs. While it is true that people trapped in an ultra-legalistic and a works or performance-oriented setting can get caught up on the treadmill of human perfection, rejecting the orthodox teaching of the Bible is surely no antidote to fix one's problems. And any help that Young's book may have been to an individual cannot excuse his carte blanche redefinition of Christianity. Once again, I have to ask, where is discernment in the church? Now remember, this is a heart-wrenching story and a very clever story, and I believe Young is a, is a very talented and gifted writer. It appeals particularly to those who've been traumatized or abused and who've been psychologically damaged. Now according to uh, one emergent church blogger who wrote this, the people the shack appeals to are mainly church people who are disenchanted with this beliefism in evangelical culture 
that having the right beliefs about God is the road to right living. This particular emergent blogger is named Pam Hogawaita. And she defends the shack saying that, quote, a relationship, and that's a word used 40 times in the book or more, is not about having the right set of beliefs. The shack captures that longing to strip away beliefism and have a real encounter with God. Now, this blogger and her opinion and her theology is more reminiscent of that of Oprah Winfrey and what she has said about God not being a set of beliefs but being a set of feelings, but it is certainly not found, sound biblical theology. Now, and neither, by the way, is Paul Young's, and I'm not alone in that assertion, that's for sure. Let me talk about some of the critics that Paul Young has had. In April 2008, Dr. Albert Moeller, who's the president of Southern Seminary and a uh, fine theologian, he quoted blogger Tim Challies, and called, who called the book subversive and seductive. And then Dr. Moeller himself called the book blatant heresy. I was a part of a panel discussion that uh, many of Albert Moeller's uh, statements were made and we, we had to sit back and just say he has nailed it. In June 2008, Lifeway Bookstores, they're, that, by the way, the Southern Baptist official bookstores, pulled the book The Shack for two weeks. And when it returned, it had a warning label that said, Read with Discretion. Concerning The Shack, Atlanta pastor Michael Youssef told his church and national TV audience, Half-truths, almost right, outwardly appealing, are far more dangerous than plain wrong and evil. The shack is a deep ditch that's covered by beautiful landscape. And Dr. James B. Young of Western Seminary in Portland and a personal friend of Paul Young's became so concerned that he wrote the following. It is often said that to understand a book better, one needs to know its author. We even say this is true about the Bible. Well, I am acquainted with Paul and his doctrinal beliefs. Thus, I feel qualified and compelled to address the contents of the novel. I am concerned that many who may read the story without discerning what Paul writes undermines biblical evangelical theology, the gospel, and the institutional church founded by Jesus himself and the apostles. Yet in the end, this is a critique of the novel, not Paul. Paul may affirm publicly that he has changed his beliefs or is in the process of changing them. He may, may, he may make many disavows. Yet the novel is the written document that presents what Paul believed at the time he wrote it. It is the object, it is this object that lies before the reader that needs to be critiqued. Now I want to illustrate that these are not just sensationalized concerns and just tell you a few things about what is in this book, The Shack. And you know, it really all boils down to whether one believes the Bible or not. And people who are listening to me, either here in an audience or via DVD, they may say, well, now it's just your opinion, but I'm going to be quoting the shack quite a bit and talking about some of the concerns I see in it. So where did Paul Young get some of these theological ideas? Young himself is a Canadian who went to Canadian Bible College. That's a place where I have personally have ministered on two different occasions. He went there for three years up in Saskatchewan. Then he transferred to Warner Pacific College in Portland, Oregon, where he graduated summa cum laude with a religion degree in 1978. Now, I have a friend who was in school at Warner Pacific at the same time. This is a man who I've known for well over 20 years, a trusted pastor, a trusted friend. In fact, I serve on a board with him. And he, he said the biblical literature uh, professor back in those days, a man named Arthur Kelly, taught many times in his class that all of the Bible was not for us today, that the Bible was only allegory. And he said more than one student publicly argued with Professor Kelly, one yelling as he walked out of class, doesn't anyone around here believe the Bible anymore? Well, if that's where Paul Young was getting some of his theological ideas, it's really no wonder if these things were solidified in his heart by the teaching he received there at Warner Pacific. How does the shack say that God communicates to us? You know, without even opening the book, it, it begins to be a, a problem with us. If you just read the synoptical reviews about the book, it begins to be a problem because is God reduced to passing notes to people? Is that how God communicates? No. God communicates through his word and God communicates by his Holy Spirit. He doesn't pass notes to people and ask them to meet him in a shack. God is wherever we are. He will be there for us. If we're willing to talk to him, he's willing to listen and to speak back to us. What does the shack say about the Holy Trinity? This is one of the major points 
in this particular book. Well, the shack portrays God as a large African-American woman whose name is Papa. Uh, and, and really, that's tough for me to talk about because of the gender problems. Uh, and the, the name for Papa in the book is Elusia. Jesus is a Middle Eastern man, a carpenter, and the Holy Spirit, Surayu, is an Oriental woman whose name symbolizes creativity. So we have a type of trinity being shown to us here. However, as I did the research on this and just doing some Googling on the internet, I found out that in Polynesian and Hawaiian cultic religions, there is a figure closely resembling Paul Young's Papa figure. I'm going to quote from a particular website I found. She is a guardian of the spirit realm where souls of the future humans are breathed into existence. Goddess Papa represents the wise woman and keeper of the secret mysteries of the divine magnetism. It is claimed about this pagan goddess that from her we find comfort and care of unconditional love in times of crisis and grief. Her intervention instills calming reassurance and healing. All can call upon Goddess Papa for guidance. And again, Papa is a, a dark, large woman in this Hawaiian mysticism. Young told me personally when I discussed this with him, and I asked him many questions the day I met with him in Portland recently, Young told me that he was unaware of any such Papa deity. Now, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it is hard for me to believe, especially considering where his upbringing is from. Uh, he was in New Guinea, that is in the South Pacific, and you, you begin to wonder, did he know? But I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and let you decide. Concerning the Papa of the Shack, Dr. Larry De Bruin, who I was on a plan panel with, I mentioned we were on a radio panel with my friend Jan, Jan Markell, and we were quoting Dr. Moeller quite often, but Dr. Bruin, De Bruin said this, On the emotional level, the Shack's concept of the goddess might be linked to the Black Madonna's spirituality. The Black Madonna calls us to grieve. The Black Madonna is a sorrowful mother, the mother who weeps tears for the suffering in the universe and the suffering in the world and the brokenness of our own venerable hearts. Now about the, the, the Eloisa or Papa figure in the shack, this is a combination of the Hebrew name for God, the Creator, which was El, and the Greek word Eleusia, which the early Christian origin used in the third century but was quickly condemned because it came from pagan Greek philosophies. Among other characteristics, this particular God figure is called the creator God who is truly the ground of all being. And that's what Paul Young says in the book The Shack on page 111. Regardless of the stated reasons why Papa appears to Mac as a woman, this idea is much closer to Mormonism than it is biblical Christianity. And it was a question I asked Paul Young about uh, the idea of having God appear in human form. Sarayu is a mystical river, by the way, in ancient uh, India, and it's related to the deity Kali in Hinduism. Now, Paul Young's portrayal of the Father and the Spirit in sinful human nature is just not unbiblical. To me, it is completely forbidden in Scripture. And as we see here in Romans chapter 1, Paul speaks directly about this. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the, an image made like a corruptible man. Of course, the passage continues, but that speaks directly to the idea of God appearing as a man. Now, in my conversation with Paul Young, I suggested to him that Romans 1 clearly forbids the type of thing that he had written and taken carte blanche to do so in his novel. Uh, he became somewhat defensive to me and he responded that the Apostle Paul's admonitions was only, and I'm quoting, only because of idol worship. Then he said to me, do you suppose anybody is going to worship her, the Papa character? And I told him I thought someone might, especially those who either were so disenchanted with Christianity or had no understanding of Christianity yet read her book, they might perceive that the church has been wrong all along, which is, of course, what the emergent church says, and uh, that they would accept his idea of God. And I told him somebody might, but it was about the perception of God. 
and the image of a finite man and the imagery in his book that was completely contradictory to scripture and was also very confusing and of course on this Young vehemently disagreed with me in our private conversation that we had on this. He defended Papa by pointing out that God describes himself with eyes and ears and hands and arms. And I responded that this was so we finite little pea braid human beings could get a grasp on the infinite creator God of the universe. And that I believe the argument that Paul Young is making, and I told him this, was more uh, in, in, akin to Mormonism, as I've already mentioned. And I ask him to be careful with, with just saying because God says that he has eyes and ears and hands and arms and uh, other body extremities, uh, just because God says this, does that mean, according to Psalm 91, that God also has wings? You know, this is what I say to Mormon missionaries when they show up at my door. The idea that uh, they say God appeared as a man and they use scriptures trying to prove it that says God has body parts. And I'll go, wait a second, does God have wings? Because Psalm 91 clearly talks about under his wings we'll find refuge. Chuck Colson's breakpoint commentary said this about the shack. This is the root of the book's problems. In the course of the biblical narrative, God the Father never reveals himself in the form of a human. In fact, Christ rebukes his disciples for even suggesting it in John 14, verses 5 through 10. The shack would not dispute these limits of understanding. It dedicates many pages to chastising believers who cling too tightly to traditional views of God's nature. Yet instead of expanding our thinking and our appreciation for divine mysteries, the book shrinks them quite dramatically by creating a deity so clearly influenced by human expectations of what God should be. Young was asked on Oregon Public Radio during the interview that I've mentioned how he came up with the image he used for God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. He stated, Always keep in mind that I'm writing a story for my children, not thinking that, you know, anyone else is going to read this. And, and my immediate question as I heard this on the radio was, what? You mean that's the God you wanted your children to know about? That's the God that you thought they should grow up understanding? That was the theology you wanted to instill in them? And at this point in the interview, the interviewer challenges Young that he indeed went through an editing process, and he responds, and I'm quoting, but I wanted this, meaning he wanted the redefinition of God. He states, I wanted this from the very beginning because I don't want my children to grow up with an idea that God is a Gandalf with an attitude or a Zeus or some big white guy, and that's what we have in Western theology, that conception. I want my children to have a relationship with this God, that is not stuck in the boxes I grew up in. Paul Young, again, seems to go out of his way to distance himself from anything considered orthodox or any understanding that we have of Christianity. He stated, even though it's a work of fiction, you cannot avoid theological content in the book. And he's right about that. Young says that many unbelievers are buying into the book and giving it to Christians. He said, quote, suddenly God and the idea of relationship has become accessible. Religion tends to hide that. And for a lot of us, we grew up with a very angry God who is at a distance and who set up standards that we couldn't attain, especially those of us who are damaged. And let me just speak to that. God's word does not set standards that we cannot attain. God's word in the New Testament with the grace and mercy of the cross doesn't give us anything more that we can't do. Whenever God's word says thou shalt not or gives us a command to do something, it is always in our best interest. The Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Paul is clear about that. Yet because of the image Paul Young had as a child, the image that may have been imposed upon him by his parents. I can't say for sure, but it sounds like it. He has decided to reformulate Christianity into something the scripture says it's not. While visiting Portland in October 2008, I heard Young state twice that the name for, in Hebrew for God was El Shaddai. And that's correct. But he said it is a feminine gender reference. Young stated that Shaddai itself means breast or breasts. When I quizzed him on the gender problem of, with Papa, this argument came up, and uh, we, this was the argument he made to me personally. 
each time I heard him speak in person, which was, by the way, three times in person, and uh, several media interviews, and also he, right, uh, reading his interview in the Warner Pacific University Alumni Magazine, summer 2008, he promotes the femaleness of God. Now, emergence and liberals and New Agers, uh, they all promote this feminist idea. Now, from a response he gave me to a question, this may be where Young got the idea. And after digging it, after I talked to him, digging a little research here, we come to find out the Harvard Divinity School presented a project from 1990-91 by Harriet, Lutz, Harriet Lutzke, professor of psychology and sociology of religion from the University of Paris. And in this particular project, Lutzke claims there is evidence that Shaddai was a Semitic goddess. Now, folks, that is pretty far out, and I don't think we have any Orthodox Jew ever agree with that statement. Paul Young's defense for the gender of the God of the Shack comes right out of a movement, it would appear, that 20 years ago sought the feminization of God. And the truth is that Paul Young's tragic childhood and bitterness toward his earthly father has paved the way for the Shack goddess named Papa. I believe this book may do more to bring about the feminization of God than any of the new feminized versions of the Bible that are out there. And my heart breaks for Paul Young, but as an apologist, it breaks for millions of people who will be affected by the rendition of God that we see in the shack. And my responsibility is to speak the truth, not just to pat somebody who's hurting on the head. Real healing can come to Paul Young through the gospel of Jesus Christ if he'll repent and come back to it. I have seen the mock trailer for the movie, The Shack. Can you imagine the confusion unsuspecting moviegoers may face because Paul Young disdains the image of God as an angry white guy and then sought to change it? Is it not enough, according to Young, that at the time of the filming of this DVD today, 87,000 copies a week are, are being sold of the book, The Shack, in the secular marketplace? Just wait till the movie comes out. Now to pastors, if you don't think this is any big deal, you may want to consider how that you're in a dialogue with people who completely have a different conception of the identity of God and how this may have been convoluted by the powerful images of an allegedly biblical feminine God named Papa and how that may be burned in their minds by the motion picture. On page 95, Paul Young talks about the Incarnation. Now listen to this for theology. Quote, Mac noticed the scars on her wrist, on Papa's wrist, like those he now assumed Jesus had on his own. Note that these scars are present on the wrist of the Father and not of the Son as well. Young teaches that God died on the cross with Jesus to reconcile man to himself. I heard him teach this at Warner Pacific when I listened to him down in Portland. He uses 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 as proof that God died on the cross. Now, this is anything but orthodox. Jesus went willingly to the cross. He acquiesced to the will of the Father. He went of his own will. The Father did not die on the cross with Jesus. But by page 99, it becomes clear that Young's version of the Trinity is not the biblical version of the Trinity. Page 99, again, talking about the Incarnation, it says, When we three spoke ourselves into human existence as the Son of God, we became fully human. We also chose to embrace all the limitations that this entailed. Even though we have always been present in the created universe, we now became flesh and blood. No, God the Father is spirit, according to John chapter 4. God did not become uh, a, a, a being. That, again, sounds like Mormonism. Now, Sarah Yu, according to the, to the book, talks about the hierarchical structure of God's plan. And Sarah Yu states to Mackenzie, or to Mac, she says, or the spirit, or however we can talk about this, it's tough to talk about this because you have God being called Papa, yet it's a her. But anyway, it says, Mackenzie, we have no concept of final authority among us, only unity. We are in a circle of relationship, not a chain of command or a great chain of being, as your ancestors termed it. 
what you're seeing here is relationship without any overlay of power. We don't need power over the other because we are all looking for out for what is best. Hierarchy would make no sense among us. That is on page 122 of the shack. Now, all I ask is that you just try to make that square with the scriptures. On page 145 of the shack, the shack's Jesus says this, We are indeed submitted to one another and always have been so and always will be. Papa as much submitted to me and I to him or Sarayu to me and Papa to her. Submission is not about authority and it is not obedience. It is all about relationships of love and respect. In fact, we are all submitted to you in the same way. Mac was surprised. How can that be? Why would the God of the universe want to be submitted to me? And Jesus answers, because we want you to join us in our circle of relationship. I don't want any slaves to my will. I want brothers and sisters who will share life with me. Now, where, just tell me, is the uniqueness of God? Where is his holiness? Where is his worship? Where is the idea that he is the creator of everything? Where is the idea that he is higher than men? I note also in this that every time Jesus is talked about, he is never in the book of the shack called the Christ. And I don't know that I've heard anybody else talk about that in all the stuff I've read about it, all the research I've done. But this is not Jesus the Christ. See, Christ is his last name. Jesus the Christ means Jesus who was the Messiah, the one who came to set captives free. This again speaks to the idea that the Jesus in the book is not the Jesus of the Bible. What about authority and institutions? Throughout the book, Young takes a swing at authority, claiming on page 124 that institutions are a diabolical scheme and a trap for mankind. However, the scripture tells us that God establishes governments in Romans chapter 13. That Jesus established the church in Matthew chapter 16. And the book of Acts clearly instructs us about the establishment and the authority structure that developed within the church after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Young shows his detest for the church itself when he has Papa state. And remember, this is the writer speaking his ideas through these very powerful figures he has constructed. He says, the church is not a bunch of exhausting work and how long lists of demands and not sitting in endless meetings staring at the back of people's heads, people he really didn't even know, just sharing life. Images of family devotions from his childhood were spilling, came spilling into his mind, not exactly good memories, it says on page 178. So he is against the structure of the church. Now, on the church itself, Dr. James B. Young stated this, Paul has shunned the institutional church, holding church instead in a private home with his family and some friends. He has regularly opposed other institutions associated with the church, such as seminaries and Bible schools, and has opposed the institution of the government. In the shack, he identifies all institutions as demonic systems and power control entities to hinder relationship with God. About seminary training and theology, page 91, it says, Max struggled to keep up with Papa to make some sense of what was happening. None of his old seminary training was helping in the least. On page 182, about the fact of just being a Christian or the idea of being a Christian, Jesus mocks the idea of the word Christian. Now, this is the shack Jesus, not the biblical one. It says, who said anything about being a Christian? I am not a Christian, said Jesus. Young is mocking the critical idea of the Bible itself, the critical authority of the Bible itself. On page 107, it says he half expected Jesus to pull out a huge old King James Bible. In fact, the shack never uses the Bible to make any assertions or points, and his admissions of empirical truth are glaring. But now I want to examine what is perhaps the most talked about aspect of the shack and the theology therein. And that's the idea, does Paul Young believe in universalism? USA Today, June 24th of this year, said 83% of mainline Protestants believe that there are multiple paths to eternal life. 
Now, in that same report, which was from the U.S. Religious Landscape Survey, a poll of 35,000 Americans by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, it also said 53% of evangelical church attendees say they believe that other religions can lead to eternal life. With, with facts like this, it is easy to see why universalism isn't a problem to so many people in the church today. And though in the shack, Young makes illusions to the idea of classical universalism, I and others are not concerned so much with that, but the embrace of a type of Christian universalism called universal reconciliation. Now this is the idea that every person, regardless of what they may believe, or even if they believe, are now made righteous because of what Christ did in the sacrifice on the cross. That is, that every person is already saved. There is no need for repentance. There is no need to be concerned about sin. That the mission of the church is just to announce God's love to the world. However, whether it's called reconciling, reconciling universalism, whether it's called inclusionism, whatever name it might be called by, this excludes the responsibility for man to respond to God's free offer of salvation and accept that gift of salvation. Now, Young denies being a universalist in nearly every interview. And twice I have seen him volunteer that information without the interviewer ever bringing it up. He did that on James Robison's TV program. He also, uh, in the uh, interview in Warner Pacific Magazine, the alumni magazine of um, the summer of 2008, he volunteered that information without being asked about it. However, Dr. James V. Young, who I've mentioned already, a professor at Western Seminary in Portland, is refuting Young's claim as knowingly false. And Dr. D. Young, a longtime friend of William Paul Young, says that he and Young co-founded a theological discussion forum known as the M3 Forum several years ago, and that he knows Paul Young's theology. They used to discuss anything and everything, uh, Dr. D. Young told me in a conversation I had with him just today. Dr. DeYoung claims that what Paul Young's theology, what he admits in his theology, are as great as the open heresies he's bringing forward. And he's written a very scholarly piece that we'll link on our website at ericbarger.com that you will find there. We'll have a whole section in the Information Center that deals with the book, The Shack. And uh, this piece is called, At the Back of the Shack, A Torrent of Universalism, a review by Dr. James B. De Young. Dr. De Young, by the way, is a PhD. He's a good thinker. He's a solid Christian. And he said this, this critique is necessary because of the significance of universal reconciliation. Their critique is not a complaint about Paul's often creative writing. It is a concern about the doctrine, the truth revealed in the Bible and how it may be distorted. Universal reconciliation is not a minor doctrine. It goes to the heart of the evangelical faith who God is, what he accomplished at the cross, what sin is, how and when people are saved, what the nature of the judgment after death is, etc. And we'll again have that. That's, you can also find that at theshackreview.com, Dr. DeYoung's website that is specifically dealing with the issues surrounding the shack. Dr. DeYoung continues, Paul has affirmed universal reconciliation on several occasions, as he cited in May of 2007, and in different ways. For example, he has verbally acknowledged recently that his editors removed all reference to universalism from his novel. In addition, on websites for his book, his editors claim that they took uh, a whole year to remove universal reconciliation and even affected Paul's personal beliefs to a degree. On the back of the novel, among his acknowledgments, Paul lists several authors who have influenced him. And among these are at least three universalists. He also cites with approval a universalist at the beginning of chapter 14. Dr. DeYoung asked, Do not these features connected to the writing of the novel suggest that universalism is in the book? In his paper, Is the Shack Heresy?, publisher and editor of the Shack, Wayne Jacobson, defends the manuscript as being free from what he calls ultimate reconciliation. So they've changed the term there. Though in this paper, Jacobson scoffs at just almost every point of concern that I have brought up uh, and call it, calls it heresy hunting, he does admit that Young's original manuscript contained ultimate reconciliation. That would be universal reconciliation to all the rest of us. 
Listen to the phrasing of this quote as the God of the shack, Papa, speaks. Those who love me come out of every stream that exists. They were Buddhist or Mormons, Baptist or Muslims, Democrats, Republicans, and many who don't vote. We were not a part of any Sunday morning or religious institution. I have followers who were murderers and many who were self-righteous. Some are bankers and bookies, Americans and Iraqis, Jews and Palestinians. I have no desire to make them Christians, but I do want them to join me in their transformation. Mac asks for clarification. What does this mean? That all roads lead to you? Not at all, smiled Jesus. Many roads don't lead anywhere. What it does mean is that I will travel any road to find you. Now that's on page 182. This is, it's not exactly blatant universalism, but it's not Orthodox Christianity, and it's, it's riddled with New Age jargon such as transformation, but it's also got one blatant outright lie in it, biblical lie, that doesn't match at all. And that is the idea that some roads don't lead to anywhere. Let me guarantee you folks, every religious road leads somewhere. It either leads to hell or it leads to heaven. It doesn't lead to some unknown path. God's word is clear on that. It's one or the other. And you may wonder, what, does it really matter that someone believes in reconciling universalism, the idea that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world and, and thus there's no reason to be born again or no reason to repent of our sins? Well, people could say that believing in universal salvation in itself uh, doesn't damn anyone, but it will damn someone else if it's preached or taught by us, if it's held by us, if it's uh, uh, given to someone else through our ministry to them. It can hurt others. So what does the scripture say about reconciling universalism? And I will say that for an in-depth study about this topic, we recorded a video recently called Universalism is Everyone Already Saved? And you can find that at ericbarger.com and we go into great depth, way more than we're doing in this video. But we felt like we need to recap part of it here because this is such a, a big part of the book, The Shack. Well, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, 14, and 15 pretty much nail it. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, Jesus said, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And I, I don't think that Paul Young is sitting there trying to figure out how he can make people stumble and miss heaven. But I do believe that many false prophets are in the world today and that this book is definitely in the category of false prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now that speaks to us which are saved. Well, there's got to be people who are not saved, those who are perishing, who don't follow the preaching of the cross, who don't rely on what Jesus did. Everyone is not saved according to Paul's teaching. Everyone is not saved according to what Jesus said. In fact, Jesus said, why does the gate that leads to destruction? And the very scripture that the entire gospel boils down to is John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now if you read that in the converse meaning, it would read this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, but there'll be some who do not believe in him, and they will perish and not find eternal life. Jesus' sacrifice was for all, but not all are going to accept it. We'd love to believe that everyone is already redeemed and that, that the scripture doesn't teach that there is an eternal hell. Universalism is a demonic deception, however, that was sent directly from hell. Paul Young does answer his critics, by the way, about these things. On Young's website, which is called windrumors.com, he has written a response to Dr. DeYoung and to others, and Paul told me about this personally. Exactly like he did in the shack, it's a very creative way where Young can use a conversation with Papa to defuse his critics. He has a piece entitled, The Beauty of Ambiguity or Mystery. 
is once again loaded with a Q&A session between Mac and Papa, which leaves the door open for the possibility of eventual reconciling universalism. This article also illustrates Young's lack of respect for the nature of absolute biblical truth as he disavows the justice of God, just as he also did during the Warner Pacific meetings. He was very emphatic that this idea that God is a God of love and a God of justice is wrong, but the scripture clearly teaches it. And just as the shack itself, Young phrases God's sure and faithful word with nothing but just a huge question mark. Now, I wish during the October 14th meeting that I had with Paul Young that I'd ask him just a couple more questions. I wish I would ask him, are you a biblical inerrantist? Though I don't believe for a minute he is, I would have liked to have heard his response. Uh, I, I mentioned emergent nonsense in passing once. And uh, though he denies any knowledge of the emergent church movement, and so does Wayne Jacobson, by the way, on his website, I have an MP3 file of a radio program where he's being interviewed along with a prominent emergent pastor down in Oregon. And I, I wish that I would have asked him if he was an emergent follower, if he understood what it was. Perhaps another question that I should have asked was, does he realize that the style the shack is written in is completely inside the emergent tradition of thinking, which is to disregard history, question all previously held truths, and carry on a conclusionless, unending conversation about who God is and what he means by his word and what the actual words inside his word mean. Now, what about the shack, what does it say about the, how you know God in the future? Oh, about God's understanding of the future, which is one of the main emergent arguments. Does God really know the future? In the book, Young's conversation with the Holy Ghost figure proclaims and even triumphs the idea of theological uncertainty on page 203. The, the spirit in the book says, I have great fondness for uncertainty. Now, emergents truly have a fondness for uncertainty, but this statement is supposedly from the one who the Bible says will lead us into all truth and who is the epitome of all absolutes. Now, Paul Young believes, he told me, in personal salvation, but he's not certain about eternal separation. That would mean he doesn't believe there's an eternal hell. And when I ask him personally about Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8, which talks about that outside are the whoremongers and soothsayers and the adulterers and the liars, those who are left out and those who end up in the lake of fire. Well, he believes that we cannot really truly know who is eternally saved. And I'll tell you folks, I can know I'm saved and so can you. Everybody watching on DVD right now can know that they're saved. There is no question mark about salvation. And after our conversation, I remember sitting down there in the Warner Pacific Auditorium and thinking and writing myself a note. Does he believe in some type of purgatory where unrepentant creatures, even Satan himself, are possibly purged? I, I wondered that. Universalists are often very uncommittal. On issues like the Bible, what the Bible doesn't make clear, on issues that, that we can't draw uh, absolute distinction on, like, for example, some peripheral issues like when the rapture is going to take place or forms of baptism, whether it's you sprinkled or dunked. And I know we all have our opinions on those things, but those are things that the Bible doesn't make completely clear. Well, we could have a genuine loving disagreement on those things. But on issues like salvation and eternal punishment, things that are in the Apostles' Creed, things the early church taught, things that the martyrs have died for, there is an ultimate arrogance to say that we don't know the way. Universalists who say that there's no eternal punishment are really saying God's plan isn't really what we like. It's not loving enough. It's wrong. And we're more loving than God is. Young knows how detrimental it would be for him to actually admit these universalists. And, but I have little doubt that he does not hold to orthodox evangelical doctrine concerning salvation or hell or eternity. And if I have said nothing here to convince any of you here or any of you who are watching by DVD, please consider the most basic questions of salvation and sin. Is Jesus the only way to be reconciled to God? The shack speaks about this. The Jesus of the shack says to Mac, quote, I am the best way any human can relate to Papa or Sarah Yu. The shack's Jesus does not repeat 
the biblical emphatic claim that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. It says, I am the best way. Now what kind of gospel is that if it's only an incomplete one? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus didn't say, me and Buddha are okay, or me and whoever you think is okay, or just your feelings will be enough. Jesus said faith in him was the only way, by believing and trusting that he was the Messiah and that his propitiation for our sins, his shedding of blood on the cross is what it comes down to. Trusting in what he did for us, in who he is, God Almighty, God incarnate, walking in the flesh of a man, which the Father didn't do. And the Spirit didn't do, only Jesus. Now what about sin? What does the shack say about sin? Papa speaks and says, I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment, devouring you from the inside. It's not my purpose to punish sin. It's my joy to cure it. Page 120. Another glaring half-truth from a universalist point of view. The tragedy of the shack's popularity isn't just that Paul, Run, Paul Young has written a book that's so far off. The tragedy, again, is it's been avidly accepted by Christians and that there is seemingly such a void for critical analysis and biblical thinking in the church today. This is why we called this DVD, The Death of Discernment, How the Shack Became the Number One Bestseller in Christianity. I am shocked about high-profile once reliable Christians, and even one well-known apologetics ministry who is endorsing this book. I am shocked by it. Again, where is the discernment in the church? The Apostle Paul speaks directly to us about this. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. The shack presents a view of God, but not the God. A Jesus, but not the Jesus. A spirit, but not the spirit. And the book contains a gospel and a trinity, but it's not the gospel from the Bible, and it's not the Holy Trinity. Now, as I conclude, I just want to read for some notes that I wrote as I listened to Paul Young speak in October 2008 there at Warner Pacific in Portland. I wrote this. I like Paul Young. There are probably many nice people who teach and believe heretical doctrines and ideas, and he's one of them. Reminds me of the way I felt when I listened to and encountered Brian McLaren, who is a, an emergent leader. Paul is genuinely a nice guy. And there's no doubt that many people have found some sort of help from the story as portrayed in the shack. Still, regardless of my own feelings, my allegiance isn't to my feelings about Young or even to the results that may come from the book. It is to the Bible. This is why I cannot in good conscience recommend the shack. Now here's some more of what I wrote in my notes that day. Listening to Young, I caught myself thinking of people who need to be healed of past hurts and delivered and become as transparent as Young wants everyone to believe that he is. It is not hard to imagine why so many people have bought cases of the book to give out. There are so many hurting people. And you know, just as soon as I wrote that down, they're sitting in that auditorium. In the midst of that thought, I wrote, Oh, how seductive. I just remembered the aberrant and unorthodox theology of the shack. I caught myself agreeing with the results of the shack and how emotionally many people may be helped by it. But then that's the exact problem of the shack, isn't it? That's how it's infiltrated so many Christian homes and lives. That's the seduction that's taken place. That's the lack of discernment that we're talking about here. Many are allowing their emotions to overrule God's authority and final truth as found in the Bible. I understand that people have gone through, who have gone through extremely hard events like the sudden death or even murder of a loved one may have made a connection to this book and the millions who have been abused as a child may have related to this even more. People who are grieving 
in a prolonged state of grief, anxiety, and pain, have a tendency to overlook the things that disturb me about this book. You see, when he's written the book as Mac and as Missy, the father and daughter who is killed in the book, he's written them about himself. Both those characters encapsulate who Paul Young is and his pain. Still, I have, uh, as a matter of how this book has touched hearts, it doesn't matter how that's happened. The flawed and even cultic theology and philosophy remains in the book. I believe that Satan is using this book to pervert the view of God to some and distort and even replace the Trinity in the minds of others and confuse some who are in a grieving state and it may be more subtle to them. But about the erroneous views that he presents of God and salvation, make no mistake, it is deadly. Young states again and again in his live presentations that, quote, God is using this book mightily. And he tells many emotional stories, story after story, as it went on there in Portland. And yes, God can use the shack. Let me make that point. Don't miss it. God can use the shack. But does that mean God approves of the doctrines that are taught in the shack? When Young defended the book this way in person, in our personal private conversation, I simply responded, but Paul, God uses plane crashes too. Does that mean he approves of them? And of course, he didn't answer me. I wrote in my notes from the October 13th Pastors Luncheon, Young and the Shack are milestones in continuous redefinition of Christianity by emergent thinkers. The only way that issues like doctrinal ideas that are contained in the shack, could every attraction is, again, because Christians are unwilling to follow the Bible. Now, here is a blatant fact we've got to all come to. The fact is, if a religious group taught the doctrines and beliefs found in the theology of this fictional book, it would be the relentless focus of every apologist and minister worth his or her salt who would go to great lengths to expose this as heresy. If there was a group out there who was following a goddess named Papa and worshiping it, people would be coming unglued exposing it. This conclusion, this conclusion leaves me with a, in a very uncomfortable spot, folks, and I don't like being in this spot. What should we do if we've read the shack and we saw nothing wrong with it? Does this mean that you're a spiritual dimwit or a, or a theological doofus? Is that what I'm saying to you? No, that is not what I'm saying. Remember, the Apostle Paul predicted that in the end days, much of the church would frown upon strong biblical standards and theology, and this can happen to anybody, but it's not too late for us to turn around and repent. So the question is also asked, what if you recommended the shack and bought cases to give away to friends? Well, just like any other mistake we make, we can repent and we can try to find those people we gave the books to and talk to them. By the way, you're not going to find repentance in the shack, but you are going to find repentance in the Bible and you'll find forgiveness there too. So what if you're a pastor or leader who has recommended the shack? What if a pastor watching right now feels so uncomfortable because somebody in his church has given him this DVD? And yet he was one from the pulpit saying it was a great book. Well, I probably haven't done a whole lot to convince you out there, Mr. Pastor. I probably haven't done a lot to convince you because sadly so many pastors will not reverse direction once they've come out publicly on an issue like this. But I would hope that there are pastors who would publicly say I was wrong. I think it's healthy for us to say when we're wrong. And I've done it. I've had to do it. I felt like it was a responsibility to do it. And I... I challenge my brethren who are pastors in, in ministry to confess if they're wrong about this or any other issue. What if you're a pastor, though, who after your own investigation decides to make a stand on this issue, on the shack in his church? I just want to warn you, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. I remember a pastor who I was very close to telling me that he thought the book The Da Vinci Code was, and I'm quoting him, the most evil assault on Christianity in his lifetime. Well, if The Da Vinci Code was overtly evil, the shack is even more so in a very covertly evil fashion. Months ago, before I started developing the research on this video, a pastor called me and asked what I knew about the shack. Well, his youth pastor had passed out copies of the shack in his youth group. And so the pastor got a hold of it and decided he wanted to read it because he wanted to find out what his youth pastor was advocating. And he heard there was a great buzz around this book. When the pastor read it, he called the youth pastor in for a meeting. 
when the youth pastor argued with him about the book because the pastor was mortified about what he found inside the book after reading it, the youth pastor defied his senior pastor and was thus summarily fired, was let go because he continued to defend the book The Shack. Another pastor recently told me that if an elder or staff member defied his direction concerning something like The Shack, they would be also dismissed. And I'm not encouraging that. I'm just saying that's how serious some of these doctrinal problems are. So as I close, I want to talk about the, uh, the treasure of discernment. And we've talked about some of the problems. We talk about the book, The Shack, which is really the, the reason for making this video. But I want to talk to you about the treasure of discernment. There is nothing overtly mystical about discernment. God speaks to the hearts of believers supernaturally, either bringing approval or disapproval in our hearts. But he honors his word. He honors those who study and who follow it and who want what his word says. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Paul told Timothy, Study to shew thyself approved of God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, it's when we fail to test everything, as the scripture gives admonition of, including and even particularly that which claims to be from God, that we are in dangerous, dangerous even satanic areas. Test it all, no matter if a local ministry, Christian radio, TV, another friend or a bookstore is telling you to go do something, buy something, or believe something. Test it to make sure it came from God. If indeed we are in the end of the end days, where I believe we are, deception is going to increase. And many of those around us in the church are going to be prey to deception. It's our responsibility to help, help pull them out of that deception. So as we close... I want to remind you of a very important, very pivotal passage from the, about the world's wisest man, Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 3. Just like many in our churches, Solomon made a pact with Egypt. That's a picture or a type of the world. Solomon and the Israelites appeared to be doing the work of God, just like many today uh, who are kind of spiritually schizophrenic and showing a lack of attention to the truth of the things of God. Solomon, like many believers truly wanted to do what was right, yet he found himself sacrificing the altars to a, of a false god. In uh, verse 5, God speaks to Solomon in what appears to be the most unlikely setting or place near the most significant demon altar in his day. And there God offers Solomon in a dream anything that he wants. Here in verse 6, Solomon acknowledges God's great compassion and offers him praise. And here the wisest man in the world admits that he has human failings and without God he cannot accomplish the mission of being king. This is true humility. In the most pivotal verse in chapter 3, here we see Solomon facing a crossroads and taking the right path. And he asks God for discernment. To God, discernment is more precious than riches and health and dominance. In fact, it appears to be the key to gain all of those things. The sermon is presented in God's word, as presented in God's word, is a path to everything good in this life. And really the reward is shown to us here in verses 12 and 13. It's a reward that God gives to those who will seek him and want truth from him. Notice the word at the beginning of verse 14, the word if. Walking in God's ways, offering uh, incomprehensible blessings to us, is what he wants if we'll walk in his path. The gifts are conditional, however. Walking after him, trusting him, following him. It is a choice we make whether we'll be discerning. We make choices about following God or the latest fad or book, as I've said. The choice is ours. And unlike Paul Young and the defenders of the shack and what they may contend, walking according to God's word is not legalism. It's not impossible for us. We can truly do all things through Christ who strengthens us if we're obedient and if we are discerning. Father, I praise you and I thank you for the discernment of your word. I thank you, Father, you laid out clearly for us how to live. Lord, the question mark about salvation and about sin and about heaven and hell are, are already solved. We have no questions about those if we'll follow your word. Help us, Lord, to come to a place where we'll follow every word of your word. Help it be, as David said, a light unto our path, a, a lamp unto our feet, 
I praise you and I thank you, Father, for your sure word and for the power of your spirit as you speak to us, as you warn us, as you draw us, as you direct our lives. I do pray for Paul Young. I pray for the millions of people who have read his book. I pray for the hurting in our society, in our culture, and in our churches. And I pray, oh God, they will find the peace and freedom that they're looking for right from the throne of God through the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. This I pray today in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 